are entered in, entering into the first Sunday of the Lenten season. I hope that you'll just get your family around and bring them right before the screen that you're using and worship with us, sing the songs, and pray the prayers. We are in a state of worship. So join me, if you will, in the responsive call to worship. Come, all you people, come and worship. God, God has, has made, made a covenant, covenant with, with us. us. Come, all creatures of the earth, come and worship. God, God has made, made a covenant with all creatures. Remember the covenant and be thankful. God, God remembers the covenant and God will save us. And this is the first Sunday of Lent. Let's sing, Lord, who throughout these 40 days for us did fast and pray. As Jesus had entered the desert and began a 40-day fast as he was clarifying his mission to the Lord. Let's sing together. sign of your love 
and care for the whole creation in your desire to preserve and not destroy life. We praise your holy name. And at Jesus' baptism, the sky again revealed your love when you identified him as your beloved Son. Strengthen him with the same Spirit who empowers and strengthens each of us. We, we praise, praise your holy, holy name. For all these assurances of your love for us and for the whole creation, we praise and worship you, O God, in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let us pray for the world and for those dear to our hearts. We pray for Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
dedicating all of our lives to the Lord is what stewardship is all about. It's a lifelong journey of learning how everything that we own and all that we are has been given us by the Lord and that we offer it back to God in service and that is the deepest, most fulfilling thing in our lives. Part of our stewardship, of course, is giving money. And in doing that, we support our local churches and the needs to keep the heat and the lights and the staff paid and the work going on and caring for all the different varieties of ministries within the churches. There's many ways to give to the Broad Street Methodist Church. You can send it through the mail, to 36 East Broad Street. You can put it in the mailbox right here at the church. It has a mail slot. Or you can even give online. Whatever church you go to, please support your church, especially during this COVID time, where it's very difficult for the churches these days. And uh, give unto the Lord, and the Lord will bless you. Let's, uh, let us pray, and let the Lord examine our hearts about our own stewardship. Covenant-keeping God, whose promises is rock solid. We offer our lives and these signs of our daily living, not simply that bread might fill empty stomachs, but that through the working of your Holy Spirit, empty lives may be filled. Friendless, lonely lives might find intimacy. In depressed lives, be given hope. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children said, Amen. Amen. We'll listen now to the scriptures as they will be read in just a moment. And in preparation, the Bible says God's word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. Let's sing those words before we pray and listen to the word of God today. In the story of the flood, when Noah and his family came out of the ark and set their feet on dry land after over a year of confinement, their first act was to worship God. They built an altar and offered a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. God spoke to them and made a covenant with all creation. God gave significance to the rainbow in the sky as a sign of the covenant. Let us enter the story found in Genesis chapter 9. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I am now setting up my covenant with you, with your descendants, and with every living being with you, with the birds and with the large animals, and with all the animals of the earth, leaving the ark with you. I will set up my covenant with you so that never again will all life be cut off by flood waters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is a symbol of my covenant that I am drawing up between me and you and every living thing with you on behalf of every future generation. I have placed my bow in the clouds and it will be a symbol of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember the covenant between me and you and every living being among all the creatures. 
floodwaters will never again destroy all creatures. The bow will be in the clouds, and upon seeing it, I will remember the enduring covenant between God and every living being of all the earth's creatures. God said to Noah, this is the symbol of the covenant that I have set up between me and all creatures on earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. symbols right there on my finger reminding 
reminding us in the form of rings on our fingers that we are a married couple. We call those marriage vows that we made, taking at a wedding, a holy covenant. Our love for each other drew us together, and then we made a covenant before God and those witnesses based on promises and on mutual responsibilities to love, to honor, to cherish, to keep one another in sickness and in health and poverty and wealth till death divides us. That covenant served as the source of a reminder that we share in a bond that God honors. And Steph and I have been partners and fellow travelers and pilgrims through this life because of this solemn bond, this, this covenant. The marriage covenant is only one of many covenants that I have entered into in my life. Most of the covenants have not been so of such great magnitude. For example, I'm purchasing a 2017 Toyota Corolla. I get to use the car, but I've got to pay for it. And so I make a payment every single month. That involves a covenant, too, with Toyota. They let me use the car, I pay them. I pay into Social Security out of every paycheck since around 1969 or so. And when I retire, I plan on receiving a monthly check from Social Security. That's a covenant between me and the Social Security Department of the U.S. government. The same is with my pension plan in the Methodist Church. We all live in a world that furnishes us many covenants. For example, the U.S. Postal Service delivers letters and packages upon your paying postage and placing a stamp on each letter. What covenants are you in? How many covenants are you in? Have you ever thought about it? We live in a world of covenants. Uh, how many agreements and contracts and bonds are you involved in right now? Social Security, maybe bank interest where you keep your money safe, uh, housing loans, uh, automobile payments and purchases, stock exchange, life insurance, work agreements with your employer or your employees, health care, maybe even snow removal or lawn service from a teenager who just lives down the street. Life is filled with covenants, some great and some small. What is a covenant anyway? A covenant is an agreement between two or more parties that is based on promises with mutual benefits and responsibilities. It's interesting to me that as we read our Bibles, we, found out that we find out that God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. It's interesting to me that that's the way our Bible came to us from Israel and the early church, is that God is making covenants with human beings. God cuts agreements. These agreements are called covenants. It's with human beings. God makes promises, and the good news is that we can depend upon God's promises. Now, we all have many covenants that we make, human covenants, but human promises can often be broken. People fail to keep their promises. In fact, people make promises that they do not even intend to keep. People can try to deceive people by making promises that they have no intention to keep. People betray one another. Think of the many treaties which were covenants that some of our ancestors made with the native peoples that lived on this continent. They were given land and territorial rights, but as soon as gold or oil or some usefulness was found in the land, they were forced to leave. The promises were broken. Sometimes they were moved forcefully at the barrel of a gun of the U.S. military. Think of the long struggle of African Americans and women and other minorities in this country. The struggle they had to just grasp the promises of equality and freedom that and apply to their lives and their circumstances. Rights that were supposed to be guaranteed by our Constitution and Bill of Rights. The promise of freedom and justice for all, of inalienable life, rights of life and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, sometimes those things have been promises and covenants that have been unfulfilled. In the Bible, though, God relates to human beings through covenants. We come to the first mention of the word covenant in the story of Noah that John read the latter part of that story today. The story began with Noah in Genesis chapter 6 when God singled out Noah 
and his family and told them about a coming flood and the role that they would play in keeping the human race alive. These are the words that God spoke. I am now bringing floodwaters over all the earth to destroy everything under the sky that breathes. Everything on earth is about to take its last breath. But I will set up my covenant with you, and you will go into the ark with your sons, your wife, your sons' wives, from all living things, from all creatures. You are to bring in a pair, male and female, into the ark with you to keep them alive. Now we know something about this story. Many of us learned it in Sunday school. It appears in our Bibles that the flood was seen through the lens of the ancient people as a judgment, God's judgment, over violence and wickedness and corruption that ran rapid over all of the earth. The writer of one part of this story of Genesis described the situation in this way. Listen to these words, also from Genesis chapter 6. The Lord saw that humanity had become thoroughly evil on the earth, and that every idea in their minds thought up was always completely evil. The Lord regretted making human beings on the earth, and he was heartbroken. So the Lord said, I will wipe off the land, off of the land, all of the human race that I've created, from human beings to livestock to crawling things to the birds in the skies, because I regret I ever made. But as for Noah, the Lord approved of him. In God's sight, the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt because all creatures behave corruptly on the earth. So this was a surgical removal of the evil. But Noah and his sons found God's and, and their wives' families found favor with God. And they built the ark, and then the animals gathered in pairs. You might know the story. Noah and his family, the animals, they entered the ark. God shut the door, and the rains came and created a deluge. Noah and his family spent a year on the ark until the floodwaters receded and the ark rested on dry land. And Noah and his family were saved, as well as the stock source of all of the animal kingdom. And when Noah and his family came out of the ark, their first act was to express worship, an act of devotion to God. They built an altar, they offered a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God, and at that point, God made the promised covenant. With these words, listen to this, I am now setting my covenant with you and with your descendants and with every living being with you, with the birds, with the large animals, with all the animals of the earth, leaving the ark with you. I will set up my covenant with you that never again will all of life be cut off by floodwaters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. Now most covenants are mutual with promises and contingent on one party, both parties actually, keeping their end of the deal. I will do this if you will do that. But this one is a little bit different because it's a one-sided covenant. God makes a unilateral promise that entails no responsibility on the part of those who benefit. God made a covenant with all creation, not just humans. And God promised not to destroy all of life with a flood again in the same way that the flood had done before. God relates to creation through agreements based on the faithfulness of God, a God who cannot lie. And God gave significance to a natural phenomenon, the rainbow. Those, that vibrant spectrum of colors of light. As light is reflect, refracted through the mist suspended in the air after a rain. It's a natural phenomenon, something beautiful to look upon. I remember when I served in Africa, I was coming over the mountain and descending the mountain on a mountain road, overlooking the plains. It had been a huge rain. You could see the Lake Victoria to my right. And before me was these vast plains of Africa as I was heading towards Bunda in Tanzania. And I could see miles and miles. And the African sky just seemed to have multiple rainbows. It wasn't just one. They were all over the place. It was an incredible moment, breathtaking. But now the rainbow is infused with meaning. It's a sign of the covenant, the God's covenant. God said to Noah, when I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, 
I will remember the covenant between me and you and every living creature, every living being among all the creatures. It's just like the ring that I wear. And I'm reminded that I pledged my love and loyalty to Stephanie. Or descendants of Abraham are circumcised and remember their special calling of God to keep the covenant and be a blessing to all people on earth. And Christians receive the sign of baptism and often hear the words, remember your baptism. That's a covenant too. Remember your baptism and be thankful. And ever so often here around the church and all over the world, Christians celebrate Holy Communion and listen to the minister who says these words of Jesus. He took the cup. And when he, had given, and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he said, take, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread and wine, the acts of taking, breaking, blessing, sharing, and the words spoken serve as a reminder of that covenant with God, that it's true that God will fulfill the promise. You will be forgiven. You will be in relationship with God and with one another. You see, we serve a God that makes covenants. And this is just the beginning of Lent. And we'll be working up towards the great new covenant that Jesus made. But we trust the promises of God because we trust God who makes the promises, makes the covenant, and will keep the covenant. We trust the promise of God that says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. We cling to God's word that says, to all who received him, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And again, see what love the Father has given to us, that we would be called children of God. And that is what we are. Dear friends, now we are the children of God. And it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. We believe that promise. And we believe God's promise like Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we also believe the promise that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you don't know this God, this covenant-making God, God has a covenant and wants you to enter that covenant. You just do that by faith, by asking Christ to come into your life. And you can do that this very day. We believe in the God who is faithful. So let's close our service today with singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
join me in the responsive benediction. Go and testify to God's faithful promises. God's covenant is everlasting. Go and follow God's ways. The ways of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Go and proclaim God's good news. The time is now. Turn to God. So go in peace. Love and serve God and neighbor in all that you do. Amen. Amen.